Um, thank you, and thank you, uh, David, for inviting me. Um, I have actually uh, been to a few of the uh, Wisconsin campuses, River Falls and Madison and Eau Claire, and I keep coming back because I just believe in the commitment that the faculty and student services have to the students here in the state of Wisconsin. And I can see it, it it's special, it's different. I don't see it on my own campus and it just motivates me to, to keep coming back even though when I was in Madison a few weeks ago it was um, 12 degrees below zero. <laughs> so um, so with that, what I'd, what I'd like to do is just take one, one quick second to tell you just a little bit more about myself and then I'm gonna uh, uh, move into the presentation and talk about how, how I would like to, to organize this today. And I, I, as a psychologist, I've been trained to sort of launch into the research and give you lots of numbers, but what I've increasingly learned is that uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about today is, is, is personal. It's personal to me because um, I went to Columbia as an undergraduate, but. I was not some of the stellar students that I saw last night. I was like, wow, I can't believe I made it through here. Uh, I was recruited to play basketball. I was a middle of the road student. I, I certainly would, would argue, according to the research, I was someone who, who underperformed. Um, and I left Columbia with a B average. And it really wasn't until years later where I came back. I was a research assistant for this one professor, the only professor that I got A's from. And, um, and I, I started working for her because she was doing some research in the Bronx and I happened to be good with children, although I was bad at, at research. And th through this time, I started to learn how to become a scientist, how to write papers and find things in the library and not on Wikipedia and, and you know, and the story goes. And, and, and it was that experience and that time that got me thinking that I could be a scientist and I was someone that had something to contribute to research and, and that sort of eventually, you know, launched my career. And I, I think that's important because in every one of our classrooms, we don't know what's possible. We have students that are there um, or students that we're advising or students that, you know, walk across the, the street from us and we don't actually know who they can be 10 or 15 years from today. And so a lot of this research tries to you know, bring some empirical meat and traction to systematically thinking about how we can help all, all children uh, achieve and all students achieve. And so I really feel like it's a, it's a combination of my sort of personal, really transformation into something that looks like a professor uh, combined with the, the work that sort of makes, makes I think, this, this sort of come alive. Um, so, so today what I'd, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to give a, a talk maybe about 50 minutes, um, maybe 45 minutes, but, but please feel free to, to answer, to ask questions along the way. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing both on stereotype threat. I'm going to talk about that sort of very briefly just to make sure everyone is on the, the, the same page, but I want to spend most of my time asking the questions of what can we do next in terms of helping students uh, achieve in our classrooms and in our advising. And I wanna focus on a series of different interventions that are very new, that have been um, empirically tested. And then I thought we could kind of workshop or think together about actual techniques that we can bring into, into our classrooms. Um, what I also wanna say as a precursor is that you know, I'm a, I'm a research scientist. Uh, I'm not here to tell you how to change your teaching techniques. We're all busy. Um, we all have, we're all completely sort of overloaded. But the idea is that there is a science and a technology behind many of these interventions that are actually not that complicated and that are sort of very easy to do. Sometimes the full-blown intervention is, is a little complicated, but some of the principles about the effect of identity on education is actually quite simple. And so my hope is that if we can leave here today thinking systematically or even more so than we already have about how we can take some of these techniques and 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 sort of use them in our in our in our work that we do with our students, I think it'll be a, a successful afternoon. Um, so with that, given that I've been up since 345, that coffee is not going far from this podium. Okay, so with that I'd like to I'd like to start. And what I'd like to start off with is this basic idea that most of us, when we think about 
um, students. And we think about broadening participation so that students from members of all different groups based on perhaps race, ethnicity, region of the country, social class, religious orientation. When we think about how to help these students, we usually think about two things. One is smart people in key places, so warehouse all the information about diversity and culture with, say, a few people that are very high-level administrators, or we think about more effective tools for change, so things like uh, equity scorecards and collecting data and crunching numbers. But what I want to do is I want to make the, the case today of, of two things. One is that for people who are members of diverse groups, and this is based on any range of dimensions, as I just discussed, there's a hidden and a form of a, a overt bias uh, that oftentimes can cause added stress, so added stress in our daily environments. And what's important about the stress is that's a kind of stress that's not faced by members of other groups. So you're looking at students, you think that you're seeing the same experience, but they actually have different experiences. And that this can undermine performance, motivation, and some of the work in our lab is also showing that it can affect health. And that broadening participation in, in science and also beyond really requires trying to think systematically about the psychological climate in our classroom. So information is one piece and the psychological climate is the other piece to reduce this stress. And so, you know, I always like to start off with, uh, with a map or a map that's similar to this because the research that I'm going to talk about today really start off with a very systematic, practical question. And this is the question of why is it the case that there are achievement gaps, particularly by ethnic groups between African Americans, Latino, and Native Americans on the one hand, and white Americans on the other hand. What you're looking at is a map of the United States. The redder states have a larger achievement gap. The lighter the state, the smaller the achievement gap. The gray areas there, there isn't enough uh, data on both groups to even to collect the data. But I can actually map the entire globe, and you would see the same thing. I can map, this is by reading scores in eighth grade, but when you look at the math scores, it looks the same. I can map this around the world, and you'll see very dark bars in like Great Britain and Australia. Um, and the, the general idea is that if there is a dominant group and an underrepresented group in pretty much any aspect of society, you're going to see achievement gaps. So there's nothing special about Wisconsin or Columbia or any other, any other place. So that these achievement gaps are pervasive. But the other thing is that what I think is quite hopeful is that because there's different colors, that suggests that the size of the gap is changing. And this is not a function of the population. That's suggesting that perhaps there's something that's going on in these states in terms of policies or practices or teachers or students that is actually changing the size of the gap. And so that suggests that it's not just there's an achievement gap out there and there's nothing we can do, but that we can sort of think about how we can make all of the bars, uh, all of the states a little bit lighter. And so the research that I'm going to talk about today really tries to address this very specific question, that there are these differences between ethnic groups, but we also find differences by social class. There are differences by, uh, particularly in science among women and men. So we're interested in understanding these achievement gaps broadly, the sources of them, and how to reduce them. And so the work that we've been doing, we call it Project Achieve. The, the basic idea is that we have been, as a, as a group of scientists in my lab, we've been um, designing and piloting a whole range of, uh, we call them field-based interventions. So they're interventions that are in classrooms from middle school to high school to college. We usually partner with schools and, and educators so we can understand the psychological climate that's specific to a very specific school. We try to diagnose what that that climate is, and then we design interventions to try to attenuate these gaps. Okay, and so what I'd like to do, I'm just gonna, I, I already said that. 
Okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, my understanding is that many of you have been participating in a, a reading group, Muslim Vivaldi. I just want to bring everyone on to the same page in terms of understanding this notion of what this added stress is and, and perhaps sort of give you a little bit of uh, new research on sort of what are the consequences of it. And then I'll talk about what we can, what we can actually do. So the first part I want to talk about this added stress and so that the name that we give to it is stereotype threat. The idea being that the focus is really on whatever the underrepresented group is uh, in our classroom or in society more broadly. And so this, this absolutely never works. I don't even know if that's worth trying anymore. Um, but let, we'll just give this a try. My birthday is October 12th. Is there just anyone whose birthday is October 12th? Is that, do we have someone? Oh, how close? Oh, okay, this is close. This could work. This could work. <laughs> so there's actually usually they're like, uh, February, I don't know. Um, and so, so, so let's say, I'm just going to change, I'll change my birthday to your birthday. Let's say both of our birthdays are on October 16th. I usually celebrate the whole week. So that's kind of, yeah, me too. There we go. There we go. We, we're in this. We're in this. So what happens when you have two people in the same room that share the same birthday? So a bunch of things happen that are pretty amazing. So now I'm looking at him more. I'm looking over here, but I can notice his lovely French blue shirt. I'm like, wow, this is a nice person. If we were then asked in an experiment to sit together and work on what are called unsolvable puzzles. So these are these really nasty things that we do as psychologists. We give people puzzles that they actually can't solve. But what we're interested in is the amount of time that the, we will spend as a pair working on these unsolvable puzzles. As it turns out, when you have two people who are led to believe that they share the same birthday or they have the same name, they spend twice as long working on these unsolvable puzzles as people who do not share the same birthday or who have different names. And we can do this by just randomly assigning people. We can lead them to be, we can actually pair people who have the same birthday. The idea being that this identity of birthdayness has a powerful effect on how we see each other and how we work to, together and actually our cognitive performance, how we actually perform, our ultimate outcome. Um, and this works very, very systematically. It also works with horoscopes for people who believe horoscopes. The idea is that identity can be a powerful motivating force. Um, but if it is the case that it can be a powerful motivating force, we also know that it can actually be a demotivating force. If it is the case that your identity, for some kind of reason, makes you feel like the outsider status, the so you know proverbial ugly duckling, or, and that 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 identity can have this motivating force, or it could actually sort of diminish uh, our motivation. And so that is sort of the world in which stereotype threat lives. And I always like to start with this example because identity accounts for about 25 to 30 percent of performance in our classrooms. So that's about the difference between an A and a B. So this is sort of, a, a, it's not like all of a person's grade, but it is, a, it is a good portion of it. And so what I wanna do is sort of bring to life some of the work on stereotype threat, this idea that identity uh, under particular circumstances can have a demotivating effect on performance. So I, I want to start off with a definition, then I'll give you some examples of what, what some of the research looks like, some of the classic research and some of the contemporary research. Stereotype threat is a very general phenomenon, from women parallel parking to, uh, to, to test performance. There are over 5,000 studies at this point. So it's a very general phenomenon. It's the threat of being viewed through the lens of a negative stereotype or the fear or concern of doing something that would inadvertently confirm that stereotype. So all you need is a group, and you need a stereotype that's relevant to the group, and these are the conditions under which you have stereotype threat. Um, and this is my, my advisor wrote in his classic um, paper that members of diverse groups, again, a lot of the work is on race and gender, but it applies to age, it applies to socioeconomic status, social class, religion, um, sexual identity, any kind of otherism. That members of diverse groups can be wary of situations in which their behavior can confirm that their group lacks a valuability. 
This extra pressure caused by the concern of reinforcing stereotypes can interfere with performance. So we happen to live in the world of academic performance, but there's actually these really cool kind of funny studies on women and driving performance. As it turns out, when men are in the car, they underperform in terms of parallel parking. When men are not in the car, they drive just fine. Um, there's, there are studies on age and stereotypes. There's studies. There, there's, if there is a stereotype out there in a group, it is so easy to sort of lead people to underperform, to perform less than, than their ability. So the original studies that were done, I just want to show two in the original studies and I'll walk you through some of the more recent data and, and, and I'll, I'll go quickly for those of you who already know this, but I always like to sort of remind people where, where the original work came from. The idea is that in the world around us, we're not actually um, sure how to disentangle this experience of stereotype threat from just poor performance. So that's something I want to get back to when we talk about our intervention work. But in the laboratory, it's actually quite easy to do. So in these original studies, what happened was the researchers brought uh, women and men one at a time. They didn't think it was a study about identity. They actually just thought it was a study on test performance. They came into the lab one at a time. They were already matched on prior performance. So we already know that there's no gender differences at base between how women and men were performing. And also, these women and men were actually kind of special in the sense that they were highly motivated. They rated on a scale of one to five, at level five, that they were really identified with math. So these are like our vanguard students, the ones who care and the ones that there's, there's no gender differences. They brought them into the lab one at a time, and they just had them take a, a difficult math test, so some of the sample math GRE problems. I'm going to get back to that, because when stressors are easy, you actually get women perform, outperforming men. It's when tests become very, very difficult that you start to get these uh, stereotype threat effects. In one condition, so for one group of either the women or the men, they were given no test instructions beyond the same instructions all of us take every day when we're taking a GRE or the LSAT or the MCAT, which is do the best you can, there's 30 problems, please solve these. In the intervention condition, the idea was can the stereotype be temporarily turned off just in that one particular moment? And the researchers did this by saying, look, um, maybe out there in society there are gender differences, but on this particular test, there are no gender differences. And then the, what they simply looked at was performance. So everyone had the same test. The only thing that varied was the test instructions. And so what you're looking at here is a figure where on the y, the y axis, higher scores mean better performance. And what you find is that in the control condition, um, men are outperforming women three to one. And this looks suspiciously like the redder and pinker states in terms of the size of the achievement gap. It's sort of very similar. But I never fail to be surprised, like I made these slides, and I'm always like, wow, that's such a powerful effect, that, that when you temporarily turn off the stereotype by telling both women and men there are no gender differences, two things happen. I know you can see it, so I'll just sort of fess up right now. The, the, the strongest effect is the women that are the red bars. And what you find is now women's test performance doubles in terms of how well they're actually doing on these difficult math tests. The other thing that happens is that men do slightly less well. Uh, in any one given experiment, this effect is not significant, but there are now meta-analyses that uh, bring together about 150 different studies together and shows that this counts for about 60 points on the SAT. <laughs> so there's something about being on the downside of your own group's negative stereotype, but there's also this little bit of a boost you get about being on the upside of someone else's negative stereotypes. It's sort of like a little bit of wind behind your, your sails. And so this is the phenomenology of stereotype threat. Now, in the real world, it's actually very difficult to say that, uh, that there's no gender differences on a test. And so we'll talk about other ways that you can sort of reduce these stereotypes uh, in the context that, that we live in. 
We now know from um, about 5,000 different experiments, over, uh, over 2,000 different uh, empirical papers, that there are so many different forms of stereotype threat. There's a stereotype threat for African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, and pretty much across all intellectual domains, the stereotype being that uh, the minority students are not particularly smart. There uh, is a, gr a lot of work on women in math, science, and logic tests. There's a women, there's, there's research on older women and driving performance relative to men. There's research on uh, white males and math performance here is relative to uh, Asian American male students. The stereotype being that the model minority Asian Americans are good at math and white American men are not. Um, there's research on uh, white American males relative to African American males in athletic performance when you have them uh, either uh, jump as high as they can and they're told that this is a strategic uh, strategic uh, uh, intellectual performance of where to place your hand on the backboard. They jump just as high as African American men. When you say this is a test of athletic ability, they jump about six inches shorter. Um, there's uh, research on older individuals and memory performance, uh, economically disadvantaged individuals and uh, IQ tests in France. This has actually now been replicated in Madison. Um, gay males and play behaviors with young children, the stereotype that, um, that gay men are predators, and, and also with first generation college students. And so this is just a sampling of the, the dimensions under which uh, one can find underperformance. One of my sort of favorite studies as of, as of, uh, as of late is this study. Um, this is a study on older adults and memory. And the, the reason why I like to show this is because the properties of stereotype threat are always the same. In this particular study, they took older and younger adults, or the breaking point being just 40 years old, so above and below 40. And I just hit that above 40 mark, so I'm like now in the yellow bar condition. Um, and, and what they did is that there was a, a memory test. When you actually look at neurocognitive evidence, there's actually very little evidence that as people age, their cognitive performance declines. It declines a little bit, far less than, it, than people say that it actually does. It shouldn't actually account for differences in memory that are detectable. Um, and so these researchers tried to explain why is it that you get these large gaps in performance by, by using a stereotype threat paradigm. And in the controlled condition, when older and younger adults are told that this is a uh, memory test to just do the best you can, you get younger adults outperforming older adults, again, about two to one. When you sort of turn off the age stereotype by saying there are no age differences, again, you find this huge almost doubling in performance for the older adults, and again, this slight decline for younger adults. So I show this to my mom about once every two weeks. I'm like, you can watch my daughter. There's nothing wrong with your memory. <laughs> Just don't leave the house. <laughs> so some people say that, um, that stereotype threat, like these experiments are really nice, but that these are all sort of laboratory experiments and they really don't have anything to do with, with us in the real world. And we, we now have a good deal of evidence that's actually not the case. So as three quick examples, when you look at academic performance, um, one of the things that we find, this was a study that was done with 15,000 students from the top 20 schools around the country. They were given self-report measures of stereotype threat there's, um, they were given self-report measures of stereotype threat, the kind that we could give out on this campus or many other places. Um, and this was at time one, which is when they were freshmen entering college. They then looked at their grades at time two, which is when they graduated from college as a senior year. And for these 15,000 students, the stereotype threat effect, the self-report of being concerned about being negatively stereotyped, accounted for about 18% of the variance in students' grades. So again, about a quarter of their grades comes from this identity concern. There's work on leadership, and we always tend to focus on students, but I want to just remind us that stereotype threat is a phenomenon that's general to all of us, and so it should have implications for us as faculty as well. Um, this was, there was a, a study that was done looking in particular at what are called water cooler comments. So the way to get research done, nobody gets research done on their own anymore. What happens is you're at you know, the proverbial water cooler or the, or the, the, the sort of coffee, the coffee urn, and you're just chatting informally about researcher. So these researchers at University of British Columbia mic'd up 
junior faculty who were men and women in physics. And they just followed them around for two weeks and they were interested in these organic, the sort of number of organic water cooler conversations that came up. What they found is that self-reports of stereotype threat among the female junior faculty, but not the male junior faculty, year, like about a year ahead, predicted the number of these water cooler conversations that uh, female and male faculty had in the direction that the higher the self-reports of stereotype threat, the less women were likely to organically generate conversations about research with male faculty. And so they were actually arguing that in terms of sort of motivation and leadership becomes depressed as a function of stereotype threat. And finally, some of the work that we have been doing has been in the domain of health. What we've found is that uh, in a laboratory paradigm, the same uh, group of minority students that underperforms on test performance, we uh, sort of surreptitiously slide them a bowl of M&Ms. Uh, unbeknownst to them, we measure the bowl of M&Ms and then we leave it in the room. Uh, and then we measure it um, when they actually lead the experiment. And what we find that under conditions of stereotype threat, African-American students eat about three times as many M&Ms, and this is sort of controlling for appetite and all kinds of things when they come into the lab. Suggesting, and we've now replicate this, re replicated this with women in biology, suggesting that stereotype threat can also affect what we call dysregulated eating. And so, you know, one of the things that I do when I sort of travel around the country and I talk about stereotype threat is sometimes when I'm talking to students, I actually just pass around cards and I say, does this experience pertain to you in any way? What does this actually look like? Because as researchers, oftentimes we don't capture all of the dimensions of stereotype threat. So I just want to show you one, one example of this. So this is a, a, a young woman in science in, at Vassar College. And she says, um, I am a woman in STEM. I don't feel like my performance is any lower through the stereotype of being female. I do sometimes feel out of place in other courses like poetry or history, with everyone in the class having a similar major and no one in the class besides me in math, biophysics. Realizing that kind of freaked me out, and thinking about it now, I do avoid talking to those professors like I would talk to my physics professor. So there are many, many dimensions of stereotype threat that can be unique to your particular campus. Accents and, and uh, international accents is another sort of big form of, of stereotype threat that we really don't have a good handle on the literature, but that we know uh, has implications in the real world. Most of the time, what stereotype threat looks like is something like this. We don't have these nice experiments, but what you'll hear is students saying that they just don't do well on tests. That's usually your classic, that's how you, one sort of diagnostic that you know that there's something other than just poor performance going on. So for example, Rodney Ellis says, I knew I was just as intelligent as everyone else. For some reason, I didn't score on well on tests. Maybe I was just nervous. There's a lot of pressure on you, you know, knowing that if you fail, you fail your race. So people might not say the end of it, but they'll just say, I'm just not a good test taker. So I just want to make one more sort of take home point related to stereotype threat, and then we'll talk about what can we actually um, do about it. One of the, so I think, seductions of stereotype threat is that people start to think, well, there's something about students that are sort of carrying this stereotype threat around. And I just want to sort of remind us, sort of to make the case that it stems from the systematic structures that are in place in our school. It's not something that students are carrying around you. What do I mean by that? There was this really great um, example of this, poor, poor Larry Summers. Um, I, this was the, the former professor of Harvard University when you, and, and there was a really great study. Um, for those of you who, who may not remember, he made these rem um, remarks at an economic conference, actually really you know, well-meaning, trying to understand why there are these large gender differences in, 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 in economics between women and men. And he says that there are innate differences between men and women might be one reason fewer women succeed in science and math careers. He went on to say all sorts of stuff about his kids and girls playing with, with trucks that were pink and all kinds of stuff he probably shouldn't have said. But nevertheless, he, he was really trying to sort of sort out and think online about these gender differences. So these researchers afterwards looked at the test performance of female majors in economics at Harvard University for one year following his comments 
and found that only among women, but not men, in economics, but not the other majors, their test performance was lower than everyone else's and, then, and lower than the historic norm for an entire calendar year, for 12 months after he made these statements. So prior to those statements, their, their GPA was about 0.6 higher, suggesting again that, there's, that the environment, so if we think about what are the incidences on this campus? What are the policy changes? What are the things our administration says? What are the things that we might inadvertently say or do that these can have long lasting effects in terms of performance? I just want to sort of, sort of end this, this section with one kind of cool study that, that sort of tests this idea that the environment is where stereotype threat comes from systematically. So this, was a, this is a recent study that was done on classroom environments. This isn't really a classroom environments. This is a really small lab, but you know, work with me here. So what they did is that they had um, female and male computer science majors. They came into a lab. And what they did is that they experimentally manipulated the cues in the room. What I mean by this is that in the stereotype, what they call the stereotype threat condition, this is actually a paper called Geek Cues, but, um, uh, but there was a Star Trek poster, there were science fiction books, and there were Coke cans, which are apparently the kinds of things that you see laying around in computer science departments. Um, in the other condition, which is called the sort of non-stereotypical room, they had a nature poster. They swapped that out for the Star Trek poster. They had just neutral telephone books, although like seriously, telephone books in a computer science department. But you know, no one's ever questioned this, right? Um, and they had um, water bottles. Then what they did is they just had female and male computer science majors just simply come in there, take a test. They didn't vary anything about the test instructions. And then they asked them, how interested are you in computer science? And so what they find here is that the men are the blue bars, the red are the women's bars, and what you find is in the stereotypical classroom with the Star Trek posters and the Coke cans, men are saying they're twice as interested in computer science as women. In the non-stereotypical condition, you now actually have women saying that they're far more interested in, math, in, in a computer science than men. Nothing else about the environment changed. There was no difference in instructions, and the test performance mirrors this as well, suggesting that uh, all around us are all kinds of visual, historical, aesthetic cues that we think are incidental that students are attending to as anchors to understand the value of their identity, and that this can also have an effect on performance and, and motivation and here in terms of persistence. And so what we now know is that stereotype threat is a multi-level phenomenon. And just to sort of point out a, a couple of uh, different prop properties, and we'll talk about what, what we actually do about it. So we now know uh, there's a, a few really nice uh, fMRI studies that show at the neurological level uh, what's happening is there's a low recruitment of areas associated with learning in the brain. And there's an over-recruitment of areas associated with the self-regulation of emotions. So the very thing that you should be doing, which is your sort of learning part of your brain should be online, the emotional part of your brain should be offline, is actually flip-flopped. So that's what's happening at the, neuro at the neurological level, uh, targeting the left inferior parietal cortex and the ventral anterior cingulate cortex. At the physiological level, the way I think about stereotype threat is not like running on a treadmill, but it's kind of like walking on a treadmill when, when, the, when someone else is not walking on a treadmill. So what you find is you find increased um, arousal, this nice evidence of this of uh, cortisol. Cortisol was also directly linked to, to weight gain. Um, there's higher cardiovascular reactivity, so your heart is beating a little bit faster. And there's a heightened immune system response, particularly looking at TNFA alpha. And what, you, what that basically means is that your immune system is being worn down faster. We also find at the cognitive level that there's impaired executive functionings, which is basically working memory, the kind of memory that you need to sort of retain information, particularly short-term memory is just really taxed. Why? Because you're paying attention to the value of your identity, and at the same time, you're trying to take a test or do whatever performance outcome there is. So there is actually sort of leakage in terms of, of your memory. 
But I, I think also what's, what people don't really recognize is that over time, what happens is this, the phenomenology, the experience that students feel is this kind of uh, uh, decreased trust. They feel this lack of belonging. This sort of feel like I don't actually belong or I don't fit in here. So these are the kinds of self-reports that you'll get. What you will not get are self-reports of anxiety. So people, and in fact, under stereotype threat, people are likely to say, I feel great. They'll say, I feel great, I don't feel anxious at all. So which is a sort of another, you, this is sort of a, a, another cue. So we now know that it's a multi-level -phenom multi phenomenon that affects our biology all the way up to sort of whether we phenomenologically feel like we want to be in the environment. And, and so, you know, I want to talk very quickly about what are some of the like, first steps of just thinking through stereotype threat before we even talk about systematic I interventions. And there's, there's a couple of things that, that, that we could sort of think about and target at this time. What, one of them is that oftentimes in this moment, you might be thinking about the student's subject's, subject position, but in our classrooms, we tend not to. And what I mean by that is do we really understand who, who is in our classroom? What are the racial, ethnic gen, uh, uh, demographics? What is the gender breakdown? How many students are local from Wisconsin versus non-local? My bet is that probably most of us in the room don't know that for a variety of reasons. You either teach a big class or you teach a small class and you think you might know the students. And, and also, there's a whole nother level, which is called intersectionality. Just because you are visually looking at someone, you may not know what other identities they have, whether it's a disability or low income, a sexual identity, their political orientation. And so having some understanding that their identity is accounting for about 20% of how well they're doing in the class. Just sort of keeping that in mind, I think it's sort of one, one, one dimension. The, the second thing is direct engagement with instructors, mentors, administrators to minimize negative stereotypes. Oftentimes, um, I, I mean, I've been in, in, in countless faculty meetings, and particularly, I, I hear this at Columbia, I've heard this at many different places, where, where we don't always sort of hold ourselves accountable in terms of our colleagues and sort of just awareness of negative stereotypes. Most of the time where I hear it is in terms of sports. And we'll be in a faculty meeting and students will say, well, baseball players don't belong here anyway. We all know they only got in through the baseball team. And you know, at, 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 at Yale, one of the football players was a Rhodes Scholar, and no one remembers that one. They remember the, the, the other one. So just sort of mindfulness of the negative stereotypes are out there, number one, but also mindfulness that, say for example, if you teach in science or you advise in science, the stereotypes are out there both based on age and gender. Just sort of keeping that in mind is, is, is I think, really helpful. The, the third thing is more sort of targeted for the institutional level. But credible messages and subtle signals that reassure underrepresented students that they belong tend to uh, uh, improve performance. Um, when I was at, I won't mention which school, but when I was at one of the schools here in Wisconsin, they had this fabulous program with a terrible name. So there was a program that took underrepresented students uh, from the local community, and it basically had like a different to avenue for them to get into school, where they had to do an eight-week boot camp, then they were um, sort of advised over, over their freshman year, and if they continued to have a fairly high GPA, they were sort of matriculated with the regular students. So this was called some kind of probationary admittance program. They were sent a letter saying that they were sort of, you know, either temporary or on probation, sort of kind of admitted to our system. And the faculty knew they kind of didn't want these students in the class because some of them struggled, some of them did fine. And so this is sort of not something that the faculty can do, but at the institutional level, we all know that programs that are, have these names are attached to a stigma which give rise to these stereotypes. So this is just one of many, many examples. In our own department, we actually have a proposal on the table to so split psychology into the researchers and the more like marketing non-researchers um, because the idea was that our faculty didn't want to deal with the students that didn't want to do research. So this split already sort of create, I'm like, hello, I'm an expert on stereotype threat. Can we not do this in my own department? So I'm like, this is a big problem, folks. Um, but the idea is that these kinds of quick decisions that we make oftentimes start to label students and give rise to stereotypes. 
So, for example, messages of high standards and assurance that they can meet these standards, I'm going to unpack what these mean in terms of our interventions. Opportunities to shore up the, the people's sense of belonging. This idea that many, many students actually, they feel like they don't belong. So there's the imposter status, but then it's highlighted or it's exacerbated as a function of being a member of an underrepresented group. It's sort of kind of an appreciation of, of that is very helpful. Opportunities to affirm students' sense of self. I'll talk about what this means. Um, and the personalization of information and early and immediate feedback in courses. Both of these things are really just common good teaching practices. The idea that you can personalize an assignment in some way. For example, I'm doing these, uh, I teach a big course of 200 uh, students on introduction to cultural psychology. I break the class down into groups of five and they have to go somewhere in New York City and do an investigative reporting project about either diversity happy hours or ride along with police departments or some aspect of diversity. And in doing that, I'm trying to get the students who may not do so well on tests, but giving them more of a personal experience. Um, of course, I have two TAs supervising those crazy projects. Um, but uh, the idea is to sort of create a personal experience within this broader context. And finally, early and immediate feedback in courses. The idea that under conditions of stereotype threat, students start to underperform really early. So for example, having students, any time a student gets, say, below a B on the midterm, or your very first assignment, making them come to your office hours then. Because under conditions of stereotype threat, students are going to fail and fail and fail and fail. By the third midterm, they're, they're going to come in, pass the drop deadline, look at you really sadly and go, what do I have to do to recover? And so you can kind of, you can kind of fix that by having sort of stop gaps early in the semester. So beyond, so, so beyond that, so these are just sort of you know, anecdotal teaching moments. What I want to spend the rest of my time uh, thinking through are a class of interventions that we have been um, designing. And so this really sort of picks up where the, the book uh, leaves off. What I want to do, though, is just pause for a moment and see if anyone has any uh, questions or, or, or thoughts. But what I want to do is sort of talk about four different kinds of interventions. These are all done uh, in the field, uh, mostly in college, to, to try to diagnose the psychological climate and then reduce stereotypes. But before I go into that, I just want to see if anyone has any uh, questions, thoughts, or comments. Yeah, Mark. Yes. Um, so, so, so what Mark is talking about is, um, so there's, there's some really interesting research showing that when you take um, Asian American women, for example, and that they have this dual identity, that they're both female, which has a negative stereotype in math, and being Asian American, which is a positive stereotype in math, what happens is when you prime or make salient their gender identity, these uh, women underperform in math. When you prime or make salient their sort of Asian, Asian American identity, they actually perform much better than, than men in, in math. The reason why, I, so I, so and so, they go on to say that 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 um, that there's positive and negative stereotypes. What I would like to argue, so this is this is like my theory. There really isn't a lot of data on this. Is that there's actually no such thing as a positive stereotype because underlying that Asian American stereotype, which is that they're really good in math, is that they're not really social. And so there's this like, I, so I think there's like this. Th there's some data from another lab at Princeton that suggests that there's this like hydraulic effect that so people go. Okay, well, they're really, really good in math, but you know they really don't have leadership ability. And then when you look, um, and and also poor athletic performance. And so when you look at um, there's uh, data when you look at uh, law firms and you look if you remove the uh, technical um, uh, the the technical so IT group. Um, Asian Americans are least represented in law firms because that requires, it's a job that requires a lot of talking and, and oration. So I would, I'm not sure that there's actually such thing as a positive stereotype. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that. 
It's a, it's a, but the, the, the data is there with the priming experiment, though. <laughs> Any other um, thoughts, questions? Okay. So, so let's, let's talk about what, what we can actually do. And what I thought would be useful is to um, outline some of the interventions. The idea is not necessarily for you to leave here saying, I'm gonna do the whole intervention in my class tomorrow or in the fall, but like, what are the principles of the intervention that can be easily incorporated into our teaching? So that's, so that's, that's the idea. Um, I skip this. So um, what I want to do is I want to start off with, there, there are four very different kinds of interventions, but they all have very similar properties. They start with the following logic. The logic is we know from stereotype threat that um, people underperform, and we know that what's at issue is the value of their group identity, that they don't know whether their identity is valued, that this is a form of stress, and this sort of makes them sort of question whether they belong. And so what each of these interventions try to do is they try to sort of either take that issue off the table, or they try to reduce stress in some way, or they try to sort of build other kinds of techniques to sort of account for the fact that your identity is, is at issue. These mindset interventions, most of them designed by um, Carol Dweck, try to say, given that there are these stereotypes, that, that what kind of coping skills can we give people? The logic of the mindset interventions are that we, most of us have what's called an entity-based theory of intelligence, which the short, that's a short way of saying either you're smart or you're not smart. And um, there's actually very cool data showing that as you move from philosophy to English to sociology to psychology to biology to physics, as the harder our disciplines get, the more people have this smart or not uh, mindset. Although I, I suspect that they have this in music too, this idea of the creative genius, but I'll let Dr. Hastings talk about that. Um, and, so the, and so the idea is that when you have an entity-based mindset, that this can actually lead minority students, women, any underrepresented group to underperform. So they, they have this whole um, workbook that's been created to try to shift people's mindset to what's called an incremental-based mindset. The idea is that as you work harder, the, your brain starts to grow, the synapses come together, and that, that learning, you sort of like get better by doing. So this was a study that was done at a local community college in Valencia. I'm gonna read at least some of this for you. What they did is that they created like a whole workbook. This has now actually been done online. I'm gonna read you some of, some of this. And what they do is that they, they have this experiment where they manipulate the idea that you can either grow your brain in one condition or that you can't grow your brain or you know, so your brain is it's just, you're either smart or you're not smart in the other condition. So this is all fictitious, this is all made up. So you might be like, this is unethical, but if you sort of read the sort of general principles, you'll see that, that this is something we can easily incorporate into our classrooms. So it says, new research shows the brain, um, the brain can be developed like a muscle. And it says, many people think of the brain as a mystery. We don't often think about what intelligence is or how it works. And when you do think about what intelligence is, you might think that a person is born either smart, average, or dumb, either a math person or not, and stays that way for life. But new research shows that the brain is more like a muscle. It changes and gets stronger when you use it. Scientists have been able to show just how the brain grows and gets stronger when you learn. I'll just read one more paragraph. It says, everyone knows that when you lift weights, your muscles get bigger and you get stronger. A person who can't lift 20 pounds when they start exercising could get strong enough to lift 100 pounds after working out for a long time. That's because muscles become larger and stronger with exercise. And when you stop exercising, the muscles shrink and get weaker. That's why people say use it or lose it. And then it says, you know, but most people don't know that when they practice and learn new things, part of their brain changes, grows, gets larger as a lot like other muscles do, et cetera, et cetera. So for young children, this is like just a page. For college students, it's like several pages. They now have websites that do this. But the question of interest is what are the effects of this on performance? So what, you're, so what, what you have here on the y-axis, so you have females and males, this was some pilot data at a local community college in beginning algebra. They were either randomly assigned to the intervention or not. Oh, sorry. I'll actually just put this up here. 
And what you find is that what, what you find is for the, uh, in the control condition, which are the, the uh, uh, dark gray bars, what you find is that the female students, you only are getting like 60% of them are passing this teacher-administered math test relative to men. But after this growth mindset, they threw a little bit of this other intervention in there as well, but we actually now know that that doesn't account for the, the variance. What you find is that there's absolutely no difference. Now we're looking at the white bars. There's no difference between the women who were in the growth mindset condition and the men who were in the growth mindset condition. They also afterwards, They interviewed, so this is something that we tend not to do in the lab, but they did this, uh, they did this in the study. They actually interviewed women and men to like, sort of ask them what their experiences are like. And this is, um, this is uh, um, some data that came from the treatment group from one of the women. And they responded to the question, what did you learn from the exercise? And she says, as soon as I leave class, I go to the lab. When I leave the lab, I go home and I do more work. Even in the car, I'm studying, just doing work, doing work, doing work. All day long, I'm studying, and that, was helping, and that was helping me fail my tests. After I read that article, it clicked for me. I changed my study habits. Instead of just doing work throughout all of my other activities, I started studying for shorter, shorter periods of time, and then actually studying, just, not just working the same problems over again. I tried that for the test, and I did so much better. So the idea is one of the things that they learn. So if you know anything about working out, you don't just train and train and train all day. You train for shorter periods of concentrated, focused time. And it seems like this student was sort of taking this idea and implementing it into her own way of studying. Um, there are now, let's see, there are about 10 um, field experiments that have now replicated this, both only focused on college. There's another 30 experiments that have been done in middle school. This is probably one of the easiest interventions that can be um, implemented. The, the trick is that sometimes the data shows that everybody improves in performance. Sometimes the data shows that only the underrepresented group um, um, improves in performance. So it's not actually clear like, why, why that is the case. But it's never the case that people do worse. Um, and so one of the things to think about are sort of what are the principles from these mindset interventions that can be used. One, I, I want to sort of supplement this with a study that I think is very important for you to keep in mind. So there's a study that was done by Carol Dweck. It was um, published in, in October, where what they did is that they asked faculty um, whether they not they had an entity mindset, like you, I think my students are smart or not, or this incremental mindset, the harder you work, the smarter you get. And then they looked at the percentage of female faculty that were in the departments across the university. And what they find, lo and behold, is that as departments become harder and harder in the sciences, so econ departments, chemistry departments, physics departments, ironically, political science departments, um, that they have a higher percentage of people who have this entity smart or not, not smart or not smart mindset. And that correlates with the dropout rates of female faculty in those departments. So this mindset is one, something that Students have. Students have this about each other. Faculty have this. Faculty have this of each other. And it predicts who stays and who leaves in terms of the faculty, as well as the grades for the students. So this is like a low-hanging fruit in, in terms of thinking about the culture of genius. This is sort of low-hanging fruit in terms of what our own mindsets are and what we can instill in, in class. Um, one of the things that I do, so I try to like stick interventions in without actually like redoing my lectures because I don't want to redo that. But one of the things that I do is right before the midterm, I just, I tell students, I say, look, this is an opportunity for me to understand what you've learned. And the more you study, the better you're going to do. And then I ask them to sort of read back to me or think about what times that they studied and that they actually felt like they were smarter after they studied. And I just sort of do this at a collective level. So very simply, first 10 minutes of class. I don't know whether it actually has an effect, but I'm trying to sort of use some of the principles without sort of doing a whole curriculum online. 
there are programs where you can actually get the curriculum and have students do it as homework assignments. So varying your, your level of interest, this is something that I think is a low hanging fruit as well as something that I think the faculty need to think very serious about because it predicts dropout rates of other faculty. So this is one sort of class of interventions, what I call the, the mindset interventions. But they're, they're pretty popular. I just, when I, I'm aware of this, I'll just let you know, <coughs> um, both at University of Texas Austin and University of Illinois, they are actually integrating this at an institutional level. So what they're doing is before, when students register for across the university for their classes, the web page diverts them to a mindset intervention. And then it's a two-page website that the students have to read. They then have to like take some quiz or something that shows that they read the material. And then they have to click that they completed that before they can register for the class. So these universities are trying to integrate it at a, at a, broader, at a broader scale. So um, this can be done at the institutional level. <coughs> so there's a second class of interventions. These are uh, called wise feedback interventions. They're not particularly new, but what has been new is that we've been able to effectively show that they work both in the laboratory and, and in the field. So the idea behind wise interventions is so they raise the question, how can you be critical of a student's behavior without undermining the motivation and self-confidence needed to improve. So this is all about this idea of the mentor's dilemma, that many of us belong to majority groups and we're trying to mentor students who are members of minority groups. This is sort of the classic problem. Oftentimes we don't know what to say because you know, we don't want to seem racist or sexist or, so we don't say anything, but also you'll have a minority student who's not doing well. And the question is, what can you actually do? And the idea here behind these wide feedback interventions is to provide unambiguous, clear feedback of high expectations and insurance that students can reach these expectations. If it is the case that your identity is ambiguous, if it's unclear whether you as a faculty member value a student's identity, by raising student standards, it actually has this ironic effect. Typically what we do is lower the standards. But the idea is if you raise the standards, the idea is that we can meet the students, uh, that we can raise their standards and sort of heighten their expectations. And this sort of takes off the table this idea that their identity is at issue. So how do we do this? So this was an experiment that was done in the lab. I'll show you the lab version because it's just a lot cleaner than the, than the field's version, and I'll show you a little bit of the field data. So um, this is a study where African-American and white American students come into the lab. This has been re re replicated with women as well. They come into the lab one at a time, and they're taking, they uh, have to do an essay. So they do this essay. And this was uh, actually done at Yale. And it's scored very poorly, and they're all given a C. The, the irony of this is that this is the lowest grade that the IRB will let student, let us give students without seeming like it's unethical, because they're like, students will just die if you give them a D. It's unethical. We give them a C. Um, and so then they're given feedback under one of three experimental conditions. So they either see one of these three types of feedback. So in one condition, they're given what's called unbuffered criticism. This is just plain old negative feedback, where it says this essay needs a lot of work, there are these grammar errors, there are these stylistic errors, and it's all very negative. This is the base. So in all three conditions, they're always given this negative feedback. In what's called a second condition, which is called the unwise criticism, plus positive buffer, this is what most of us do. So the idea is that if you're concerned about the feelings or sort of worries of how you are being seen when you're talking to a minority student, most of the time what you do is you placate them with some really sort of niceties. So in this condition we say, overall, nice job. Now the problem with this is it wasn't a nice job, right? They did terrible on it. So you're actually keeping the value of their identity on the table because you're not giving them accurate feedback. They know they got to see. So you say, overall, nice job. Your enthusiasm for your teacher really shines through. You have some interesting ideas in your letter, and you make some good points. I provided, so suggested several areas that could be improved, and then, and then you still get this, this negative feedback. 
The logic of the third condition is sort of based on a, a really old theory by Irvin Goffman, a sociologist. The idea is that if you can take someone's identity off the table by sort of showing them that you see them what's called in terms of their full humanity, like you just, and the way to do that is to sort of raise their, raise your expectations of them really high. So in this wise condition, this sort of three sort of pieces, you still get the criticism, but you also give them sort of high standards, but then you also say, I believe that you can meet these standards. Now this is a problem if you don't actually believe you can meet their standards, but assuming that you really believe this, um, we'll see what this looks like. So this says, judged by a higher standard, the one that really counts, that is whether your letter will be publishable in our journal, I have serious reservations. The comments I provide on, in the following pages are quite critical, but I hope helpful. Remember, I wouldn't go to the trouble of giving you this feedback if I didn't think, based on what I've read in your letter, that you're capable of meeting the higher standard that I mentioned. As a student at Columbia, I actually never received this feedback. I never, no one ever told me that I could actually do better. It's like a very simple thing, but no one ever said, I expect you to be able to leave here publishing in an undergraduate journal. Or I expect you to leave here being able to go to a state conference. Or I to completely expect you to get an A+. And it's, it's just a very, you have to, when you think about the lives of the students, who's gonna say these things if it's, not, if it's not us? Oftentimes in advising, it's sort of what they should do, not what, their ex what your expectations are. And oftentimes, you do have high expectations, but you don't tell them that. So I, I'm always amazed. Like, I, no one ever said, you should be on the honor roll every single semester. I don't understand why you're not. And I wasn't. Uh, so, so, what it, so what do we find here? What we find here, I don't know, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but you have the white Americans are the white bars, the African Americans are the black bars. On the y-axis here is task motivation, which is the number of hours spent revising their essay. Now what's interesting about this is if you look at the students that are from the majority group, the type of feedback doesn't modulate the effects. So nothing bad is happening, but nothing good is happening. Why? Because their identity is not at issue, so you're not taking anything on or off the table. For minority students, the type of feedback has a powerful effect on their motivation and also on their grades in terms of when, they re, re, when we actually rescore the essay. So in the unbuffered condition, their motivation is lowest, followed by the criticism and positive buffer does a little bit, but look at the transformation in terms of motivation where you're actually just as critical, but you offer high standards and, and assurance to meet those standards. Now, one of the things that can be done when you think about this at a institutional level, so at, at the level in your classroom, is what kinds of projects and activities do you have that are things that are really challenging to students? Do you give them opportunities to work in research labs? Do you tell them to go work in other people's research labs or summer opportunities? You say, I expect you to go be in this summer research project. I don't, I don't see why you can't do that. These are the types of things are, that are in the moment where you're talking to a student that you can say that's very, very simple and, and straightforward. But the second question you have to ask yourself is, do you actually have different expectations of, of different students? Sometimes I look at students, I do this a lot with women in, when I teach statistics, and I go, oh, maybe they can't do that. And I think about this research a lot, and I say, and, I, and, then, and then I then say, well, there's no reason why you can't be a, a statistics major. Like, I really try to be more intentional about this idea of high standards. So you have to know what the standards are and then sort of give them the ability to, to meet those standards. The reason why I think this research is, is incredibly Im important is because of this uh, other study that's done here, the idea that underrepresented students are often not given accurate feedback. Really quick study, this was done at, um, with minority and majority students. The first uh, week of class, they were actually going to their academic advisors and they were asked to give, um, they, were at, they, were, they were being given advice about the number of classes. What you, uh, what you see on the x-axis here are students who had more experience in terms of high school, so they had lots of uh, classes already, so they had lots of experience. This was uh, in science in particular, in terms of chemistry and biology, so they already took a lot of, of, uh, of, um, of required courses, or they had less experience, so they took fewer required courses. 
If you look at the, the yellow bars, which are the majority group, what's happening is people are calibrating to their experience. So when they have more experience, you're telling them to take more courses. The y-axis is the number of classes that they were told to take. When there's less experience, they were told to take fewer courses. For the minority students, there's no calibration. So you, you don't want minority students with less experience taking the same number of courses as a minority student with more experience. You want that same toggling effect. But what happens is they don't have this. You see the same effect, again, with women in particular in, in the sciences where they're just not given accurate feedback because we are concerned about being seen as biased in some way. And so the, they almost, so when you sort of compound stereotype threat with not getting accurate feedback, there's no surprise that you're getting huge underperformance effects, right? So I have, I have two more in inter interventions. I could either stop here and we could sort of get a conversation going, or maybe I could show maybe one more intervention. Yes? Okay. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, talk too long. I'm going to skip this. Um, so the third class of interventions are called belonging interventions. If you remember the idea that stereotype threat is this multi-level phenomenon, right? And we remember, remember that at the sort of contextual level, there's this sort of intense feeling of that I don't fit in. Now, many of us have this feeling that we don't fit in, but students from underrepresented groups don't know that they don't fit in. Um, I have one sort of quick little story related to this. Um, when I was uh, first started as a faculty member at Yale, um, I definitely felt like I didn't belong there, probably because I didn't. But, uh, but, but in any case, I was there, uh, and we had just bought a house, so I was staying. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the very first faculty meeting, I was sent a, an email, and this email said that we expect you to have the coffee hot, and when, um, when the faculty meeting is over, we expect the notes. Yes, girl, yes. <laughs> You're like, oh. like, yes. I was like, what? This is racist. This is crazy. I was so I was really upset. Um, then I went next door to my colleague, a uh, faculty member from Cornell. He's white American. He also happens to be gay, as opposite from me as, as possible. And I said, "Do you see this?" I'm. I said, "What am I going to do about about this?" As it turns out, he got the same email a year ago. Why? Because this is Yale's little fun way of hazing the new faculty, that they make everybody pour the coffee the first year and take notes, and they think the senior faculty think this is terribly funny. But for me, in that moment, in my office, as a new faculty member, by myself, with the multiple identities that I have based on race and gender and the outsider status and not coming from an academic family, I sort of felt I already had this ex intense feeling that I didn't fit in. What I did, which is different than what most people did, is that I went and fact-checked, and I, and I went and I, and I now understood that everyone has the same experience, and as you go from junior to senior, you don't have it anymore. So that's the logic that's brought to this, uh, this experiment. So in this experiment, this was done, the, the idea here is of negative stereotypes and, and underrepresented, just being like you know, one in a sea of many, can lead students to be uncertain about whether they belong and fit in, and this can affect performance. This not fitting in, you find this is very intense among um, students who just came back from the military, from overseas service. You also see this is very intense with students with a variety of disabilities. In my course of 200 students, I have over 40 students that have some kind of uh, disability that they're dealing with, but I know that, but they think that they're the only one. Uh, as well as race and gender, social class, coming from a small or large urban or suburban area, these are things that can affect performance. And the idea is that to make the implications of belonging for them less identity-based, that it's not something particular to you coming from the military, or it's not about your social class, or it's not about your race or ethnicity, it's just about the experience of coming to this school, and that over time, it's, it'll, it'll pass. And this makes this experience of belonging sort of less uh, distressing. So this was a study with, that was done um, with freshmen uh, at University of Michigan. This has now been replicated at about 15 different schools. Here this was with African American and white Americans, but it's been replicated with Latinos. Um, uh, oh, again, women in science as well. And, and the idea here, so there's a whole bunch of rigmarole that goes in this. 
But what I want to suggest is that the principles are simple, that you have to get people to believe. So this is what we do in the lab to make people believe this. But again, the principles can, can work in a variety of different ways. So they have freshman students, and they have them create these their, you know, ostensible video messages. But they actually have a camera just like that. They have to we give them a script. They practice the script. They stand in front of the video camera, and they think that these video messages are going back home to their high school. Now, we could actually do that, but we actually just keep them, you know, but we could do that. So they go to um, high school students. And what they do is that they are, the way we model this is we have them watch messages from seniors. And so that, this is how they're learning about what the experimental manipulation is. So in one condition, the, the seniors, the script that we give them, all has the same thing, which is a, a, a basically a placebo, where they're talking about what their days in college are like. And this is typically what students do to, to high school students. This is what it's like, this is what I do, this is what my dorm is like, blah, blah, blah. In the belonging intervention condition, we're, we basically script the following message. One is that college is difficult. Two, I'm struggling right now, but all students struggle at first. And three, over time, this too shall pass. Over time, this too will go away. And so this is scripted in a variety of different ways. So we have them write it out, we edit it, they rewrite it, we they're watching videos from seniors. So the idea is that we actually have to get them to believe this. Then they have these videos, so they're now presenting this into the camera. But the idea is that over time, they, they actually were sort of giving them this message. There's another piece to this which I think is important, is that they are doing this with us. This is not a residential education program, because this is all residential education does. Not to say that it's not incredibly important, but there's something about the knowing that you're being fixed up that makes these effects go away. So there's, it's the, the idea is that you're sort of working under students' psychological radar. When they think that you're doing an intervention of, of, on them, the effects of these interventions actually diminish. So you have to sort of get this information to students in a way that they don't know that they're being fixed up. So it's, it's really interesting. But then what is done here is that I'm going to show you the effects of grades one week after the intervention um, and, and at the end of the semester. So what you find here, so what you're looking at on the y-axis are students' actual grades at the end of the, the, the semester. Now remember, this is a bit of a rigmarole, but at the end of the day, it's a two-hour intervention that's done once in the fall, and that's it. Nothing else is done with them. Nothing else has happened. They, they sign transcript releases, and we go get their grades. So they just they think that that's the end of the study. What you see is that in the control condition, the white American students are outperforming the African American students. But in this belonging intervention, after one two-hour treatment, 24 weeks before, what you find is that this achievement gap in grades has completely disappeared. Now, this particular data that I'm showing you is from Yale University. So you look at the y-axis and you go, that's the difference between a 2.8 and a 3.3. That People might argue that that's a small difference, but that's the difference between being on the honor roll and not being on the honor roll. That's the difference between getting into seminars there or not being in the seminars. So it's not the case that you know it takes you from failing to not failing. But re again, remember what I talked about in the beginning? That's about 20% of performance has to do with your identity. And this accounts for about 20% 20, 20 of the, the variance in the effect. And so the, the idea is that do you want to set up like a big camera like that in the back of your classroom and like get students like do this kind of intervention? Not necessarily, but the principles are there, right? The one is the recognition that members of underrepresented groups often have this ex like intense feeling of outsider status that they're not necessarily going to share with you. That they're interpreting this outsider status as that my I don't belong, therefore my group doesn't belong. And so therefore, any kind of ways that you can pair seniors and freshmen in your class, people who bring people back from your class before who have graduated, get some of the ones who did well, maybe get a few that did less well, but they still survived, to come back and tell, you know, tell war stories. The reason why these are really powerful is because you see people like you who have made it through coming back and sharing their experiences. 
And if you do this, so to integrate this into your classroom, this is sort of another kind of technique because students are using their own feelings of not belonging and they're interpreting it in the ways that we don't want them to. It's not particular to their identity. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it isn't. But that the idea is that can we then sort of take those feelings and say, everybody on some dimension feels this way, over time this goes away. And so sort of modeling that in a, in a variety of different ways, in a way that they don't feel like they're fixed up. The, the last thing that I want to say about this intervention, about the whole sort of fixing up thing, is that I actually think it's kind of an important element that they are being videotaped and then they're led to believe that they're, we're sending this videotape to their high school. So the idea, oftentimes we give assignments related to identity and they're kind of meaningless. So it's like, you know, tell me about when you felt like you didn't belong and talk to other students. They know that we don't really care about that. And so, but, but wow, like I'm gonna give this to, a high school student's gonna see that. So making these experiences and these interventions have some kind of meaning, maybe not in terms of grades, but in terms of like, it's going somewhere. Someone's gonna see it, it's gonna matter. Actually makes them believe it and buy, buy into it more. So I think that's another principle that, that goes with this. And then the last sort of principle I think that goes with this is that when you institutionalize it in some way, um, oftentimes the effects go away, meaning when you tell people you're fixing them up, the effects of these interventions uh, diminish. So I, should I, one of the things, so I could, I could talk, it's, um, let's see, it's 10 minutes after three. This is, most of the work that I've done is in the, uh, the values affirmation interventions, but some of this is in the book, and I'd love to get you all talking a little bit. What, 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 should we vote? Should I, what, what are you all thinking in terms of, uh, I, could, I could talk about this intervention or we could take questions and maybe sort of workshop some of the ideas that people are, are having and thoughts that they're having. What do you, I'll let David decide. Would, Let's 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 do that. And and what I can do is I can sort of, I can I can sort of get this in as we're as we're as we're inter interacting. And there's actually the most has been written on this. So so what I'm going to do is I will I'll stop here. Um, why don't we take a quick break, uh, and then we can um, um, rejoin in our groups, and then and then we can start having a group discussion. Well, thank you. <laughs>